So let's start with an example so we all get on the same page. There are two inventors who apply for patents in 2010 a new nerve regeneration technologies. And these applications look quite similar. They, they deal with very similar types of technology. Both of the applications are assigned to the same technology class and the same examiner. These are also both individual inventors. So neither of them is affiliated with the firm and they're both you know, solo people. They also both use lawyers to file their applications. So on face, these applications have very similar optics. They look like they would be on similar trajectories. Both of the applications receive what's called an initial rejection, which means that not all of the claims in their applications are allowed. Then their paths diverge. One of the inventors doesn't respond to this initial rejection and their application is subsequently abandoned. They don't receive a patent. The other inventor submits an amendment in response. There's a little bit more back and forth and eventually in 2013, they receive a patent. So we have these two applications, which in 2010 seemed as if they were on very similar trajectories, but three years later, one of these individuals has a patent and the other does not. There's one other thing I haven't told you about that's different about these two inventors. The application that's abandoned is from a woman named Catherine, while the application that is granted is from a man named Victor. Catherine and Victor are just two individuals, but their different trajectories and different responses to rejection are actually trends that appear quite often in the patent application data. Conditional on application, women are far less likely to receive a patent than men. This figure shows the likelihood of converting a patent application to an issued patent. So that is receiving a patent conditional on application for male and female inventors from 2001 through 2010. As you can see, female inventors are far less likely than male inventors to receive a patent, and this gap exists throughout the time period. In this work, we look at gender gaps in patenting, but prior work shows that women are less likely than men to participate in other contexts in which rejection is a common feature as well. Prior work finds that women are less likely than men to select into a second round of a competition, regardless of their performance in the first round. Female job applicants are less likely than men to reapply for a job at a firm that had previously rejected them, even if they feel that the rejection was fair. Many of us have been thinking a lot about elections in the past few months, and work by Melanie Wasserman shows that female political candidates who lose close elections are less likely than similarly situated male candidates to run for office again. Like innovation, politics is a field in which we would anticipate that there is a great deal of selection regarding who chooses to participate. So women in these settings are already a self-selected sample. And given that these findings can be thought of as conservative estimates of the effect of rejection on gender gaps. These gender gaps are problematic because they can have broader implications on the direction of policies, representation and innovation. Much of the work that determines economic and social rewards happens in contexts with frequent rejection. And if due to their differential responses to rejection, women participate at lower rates than men in fields like politics, highly skilled labor markets or innovation, the pool of ideas in those contexts will be limited and women's contributions will be missing. Today, I'll be talking about the implications of gender gaps, but this issue and idea extends to thinking about the underrepresentation of racial minorities and other populations as well. For example, female representation in politics can affect the direction of policies and actually who ends up benefiting from different policies. If women are underrepresented in applicant pools, this contributes to gender gaps in more senior roles. And finally, in the context of patenting, teams with women are more likely to focus on innovations that serve women, which suggests that these innovations are then less likely to exist if women participate at a lower rate than men. In addition to thinking about the effects of representation on the landscape of ideas and outcomes, the sort of macro level effects, there are also individual level benefits to participation in these settings. I'll focus on the context of patenting and innovation, but this is the case in other fields like politics, for example, as well. Inventors receive pecuniary benefits from patenting and career benefits. So there are direct financial implications if women don't patent at the same rate as men. 
And this extends beyond individual inventors to the firm level as well. Employees at firms that hold patents benefit directly even if they are not inventors. Firms that have patents see improved access to financing and better growth outcomes. So this means that firms with more female employees or female founders and managers, that if these firms are less likely to hold patents, this has implications for all individuals who work at these firms, as well as for the success of these businesses. Differential participation in innovation can have effects that are unexpected and appear in contexts that we don't even necessarily think of as gender. So I think this example really highlights that. Octaves on a standard keyboard are 7.4 inches wide. And one study found that this keyboard disadvantages 87% of adult female pianists. So pianos are actually constructed in a way that makes it difficult for women to be elite pianists. This highlights how a feature of the modern piano, which was actually invented by a man, has inadvertently led to female pianists being disadvantaged and less successful. This is really illustrative of the ways in which involving diverse populations in the process of innovation is related to innovative outcomes more broadly and performance gaps for underrepresented groups. In the context of patenting in this work, we ask why might women respond differently to rejection than men? There are a variety of reasons why this could be true. It could be that women's ideas or skills are of differential quality. It might be that women face bias from evaluators that leads them to respond differently. Or it could be that they face an information gap. Women want to respond to rejections, but they don't know how. It might be a resource constraint. They want to respond, but they don't have the time or money to do so. And finally, it could be a confidence gap that women are more influenced by rejection than men. In this work, we use an instrumental variable strategy that removes quality and bias from the analysis. And we explore how these other three mechanisms affect the gender gap in response to rejection. Recall that this matters and we care about this question at all because of the differential outcomes that male and female inventors have in the patent process and the implications of this gap on the landscape of innovation and inventors' individual trajectories. In this work, we ask first, do male and female inventors vary in their responses to rejection? Then we examine the effect of gender variation in responses to rejection on patent and innovation outcomes. Finally, we examine what drives this variation. And we look at these questions in the context of patent applications. But again, this phenomenon exists in other contexts as well and can contribute to gender gaps in a variety of settings. Prior research looking at the gender gap in innovation has focused on the pipeline of inventors applying for a patent as an explanation for this gender gap. So women are less likely to even apply for a patent and that's why fewer women end up receiving patents. What we do in this work is examine how a feature of the patent process itself, the iterative nature of patenting, contributes to the gender gap in patents received. So we take as fixed the proportion of women entering the process, but we think about what's actually a little bit more tractable here. There are a lot of things that drive women's differential participation in innovation. You can think of a leaky pipeline in STEM, a lack of mentors outside of the patenting process, but we focus on what we could actually potentially address and find policy relevant solutions for. When looking at the effect of gender differences in response to rejection, we find that female inventors and majority female teams are more likely than male inventors to abandon their applications after receiving a rejection in the application review process. And this is really significant. This differential in response to rejection accounts for over 50% of the gender gap in patent receipt conditional on application. If following an initial rejection, majority female authored applications had the same patent continuation and grant rate as majority male authored applications, <coughs> excuse me, there would be 13% more female majority patents in our sample. We find that having firm support, so having an employer sponsor an application, decreases, decreases but doesn't eliminate the gap between male and female inventors. Broadly, women are underrepresented in patent applications. Fewer than 15% of patent applications have at least one female inventor. So put differently, this means that more than 85% of applications come from male inventors or all male teams. So this is a really stark gender gap. So much of the research, again, has focused on why only 15% of applications have any female inventors. 
conditional on applying, as we saw earlier, women are less likely to receive a patent. <coughs> Another important feature of the patent process to keep in mind is that the process itself is highly iterative. It's not a straightforward process. It involves a lot of back and forth with the patent examiner generally, and it often takes a few years. More than 80% of applications receive what's called an initial rejection, which means that not all of the claims in the application are allowed right away. But just receiving this rejection doesn't necessarily mean that the idea is bad or shouldn't be pursued further. 63% of applications that receive an initial rejection are eventually granted a patent. So it does pay off to remain in the process and follow up on rejections because the majority of these rejected applications eventually convert to patents. Today I'll explore how an information gap, resource constraint, or confidence gap drive differences in male and, females inventor, male and female inventors' responses to rejection. One thing I want to be clear about is when I use the term persistence, this is just shorthand for describing the gender differential in response to rejection. I'm not trying to make an essentialist argument about men versus women, but rather just describe this differential response to rejection. Instead, what I want to do is really understand how these factors affect gendered responses to rejection. We know from prior literature that women are less likely to receive patents than men. And the contribution of this work is to causally measure how differential responses to rejection drive this outcome. In addition, we identify pot potential ways to address this gap in patent receipt. So what we do is examine the evaluative trajectory of a given application. So the unit of analysis in this work is the application. And the question we ask is, where do applications drop out? To do this, we use data from the US Patent and Trademark Office on utility patent applications from 2001 through 2012. So the thing to note here is that much work that uses patent data focuses on granted patents, but here we have the full set of applications, both those that are successful and those that are unsuccessful. So you can not only see goals, but you can see shots on goal. Utility patents are for the types of things that you would expect to be patented, new processes, machines, and products. We limit to applications for which all inventors are US-based in order to have more confidence in the accuracy of our gender identification process. So inventors don't self-report gender when they apply for a patent, so we have to impute gender. And we do this using data from the Social Security Administration on baby names. We characterize names that are given to females more than 90% of the time as female names, and those that are given to males more than 90% of the time as male names. And we drop all names that fall between uh, 90 and zero. So any names that we feel are ambiguous and could be e either male or female. We limit only to applications for which we can assign gender for all applicants. And this leaves us with almost a million applications. What makes this a really rich context in which to study innovation is the ability to really observe each interaction and stage. And the fact that we have a full map of all of the actions taken by both patent applicants and examiners. Now, I want to talk you through the review process for patent applications. Patent applications themselves consist of a description of an invention and a set of claims that define the scope of the protection of the application. So what the inventor will have the rights to if the application is granted. An assigned examiner evaluates these claims and an examiner remains with an application throughout its prosecution. Here I'll show you what this trajectory looks like for single gender teams and solo individuals. Together, uh, applications from single gender teams and solo people account for almost 90% of the sample. So this is pretty representative of the full sample. So you apply for a patent and then you either receive what's called an initial rejection or the patent is immediately granted. One thing to note here is that this figure just shows raw proportions with no controls. So you'll see that female applicants are more likely to have their patents granted right away. But I'll show you in a few slides that this difference goes away once we add controls for technology classes. So after receiving an initial rejection, an inventor has a decision about whether they want to follow up or not, after which they can submit an amendment and respond to the examiner's comments or abandon the application. And this process, again, is quite iterative. So it goes on from here. One thing that's important to note is that there's no official end to the patent application process. 
even after receiving what's deemed a final rejection, inventors can respond to their examiner's comments. So very often you see people receive even multiple initial rejections. There's a lot going on here. So what I want you to focus on is what happens after this first initial rejection. What you see is that women are far more likely than men to abandon their applications after getting an initial rejection. Almost 22% of applications from women are abandoned following an initial rejection, whereas for men, that comparable number is just 13.5%. And this has downstream implications for who ends up with a patent. More than 63% of applications from men that receive an initial rejection eventually convert to a patent. But for women, this number is less than 50%. So there are real implications for who ends up with a patent. What we want to do first is to make sure that women are actually differentially likely to receive patents in the data when we add controls. Because again, what I was showing you before was just raw proportions. So conditional on technology that women use, we want to make sure this still, it still holds. So first, before I get into these results, I want you to note this female definition here. In order to make sure that these results and the results I'll show you throughout are not sensitive to specifically defining the presence of women in one way, we try a few different definitions of the, of the presence of women on applications. So in the first column here, we just look at the proportion of women on an application. And you can think of this really just as the directional indicator. It's hard to interpret this coefficient exactly of what happens when the proportion of women on an application is higher. Then half female is equal to one for applications for which uh, authorship is 50% or more female. All female is equal to one for applications with all female authorship. And then finally, we focus just on applications that come from solo inventors and compare female inventors to male inventors. This is arguably the cleanest regression. The first row here presents the results of an OLS regression of the impact of gender on initial rejection rates. So what we see is that applications whose authorship is more female are slightly more likely to receive an initial rejection compared to applications with more male authors or, or a higher proportion of male authors. If we look at column four, for which this effect is the largest by magnitude, we see that female inventors are 0.9 percentage points more likely to receive an initial rejection. But if we actually look at the size of this effect, this coefficient estimate suggests that women are only 1.16% more likely than men to have their initial claims rejected if you divide this effect by the mean. So what this suggests is that women are more likely to get an initial rejection, but the size of this effect is actually quite small. Then we look at this in the second panel as the, at the effect of, on actually receiving a patent. So what you see here is that this effect is significantly larger. Uh, for example, when you look at solo inventors, again, female inventors are 7.68% when we again divide this coefficient by the mean, less likely to receive a patent than male inventors. So what we see here is that female inventors are more likely to get a rejection, but they're much more likely to end up not converting the application into a patent. So what this suggests is that there exists a gender gap in application conversion rates that is not driven by the differences in initial rejection rates. So there's something else that goes on even after receiving the initial rejection that leads women to fall out at a different rate. Ideally, we could directly evaluate the effects of rejection on continuation in the patent process for both male and female inventors. So one way to do this would be through an experiment in which rejections are randomly assigned. And then I could measure how male and female applicants respond differently to rejection. However, in this context, we obviously can't run that experiment. And in the administrative data, quality is a confound that can affect both the receipt of rejection and the decision to continue in the process. So for example, let's say I submit a patent application that I think is of poor quality. If I receive a rejection, I'm much less likely to make the decision to continue to invest in that idea. In order to deal with this, we use an IV approach that takes advantage of the fact that patent examiners are quasi randomly assigned to applications. What this strategy takes advantage of is the fact that patent examiners themselves vary in how stringent or harsh they are. 
some patent examiners are far more likely to give rejections than others. And again, keep in mind that patent examiners remain with the application throughout its entire lifetime. So even when an individual submits or a team submits an amendment, it goes back to the same examiner. So for examiner stringency or harshness, as I'll call it today, to be a good instrument, there should be no relationship between an application's quality ex ante and how harsh the assigned examiner is. So we don't want some examiners to systematically be getting better or worse applications. What this figure does is relate examiner harshness to two variables. The first is the actual initial rejection rate, which is shown in red, and the predicted rejection rate, which is shown in yellow. By construction, the initial rejection rate is perfectly correlated with examiner harshness. Predicted rejection, on the other hand, is based on observables that proxy for quality ex ante, like the number of inventors on an application, the proportion of female inventors on an application, whether the application is assigned to an employer and who that employer is. So what you see here is that there's no relationship between examiner harshness and these covariates. So we feel confident the instrument works and examiner harshness is unrelated to application quality. There are two outcomes we're interested in here. The first is whether patent applications are continued. So that is, do inventors submit an amendment after they receive a rejection? The second is whether or not a patent is granted at the end of the evaluation process. So does this application convert to a patent? First, I'll show you my main results using the instrument for initial rejection. Again, we have the same definitions of the presence of female inventors on these applications. The first row here shows the effect of receiving an initial rejection on continuing in the patent process, so on submitting that initial amendment. Applications from teams made up of 50% or more women are more than three percentage points less likely to submit an amendment when compared to applications from majority male teams that also receive rejections. And when we focus on applications from all female teams and solo women, this effect actually increases. Next, when we think about the effects on patent receipt, these effects are even greater in magnitude. Teams with 50% or more women are significantly less likely to receive a patent than teams with fewer women that also receive rejections. So we can see here that, that this, the receipt of rejection is really what's driving this differential fallout. Next, we look at this specifically for the set of teams that are composed of both men and women. And if you recall, almost 90% of applications come from single gender teams or solo individuals. So together, these represent about 10% of the whole sample, these mixed gender teams. So what you see here is that for both the likelihood of submitting an initial amendment after receiving a rejection and receiving a patent, teams with more women are less likely to, to do either of these things. So what these results suggest is that the effects are not driven solely by single gender teams or by solo inventors, but rather that this dynamic of differential responsiveness to gender or to rejection by gender is also present in teams composed of more women. Given that there is such a strong effect of the first rejection, I was also interested in if multiple rejections contribute more to this gender gap. So the idea that you know, even at the final rejection stage, women might be more likely to drop out or that the number of rejections becomes important. Interestingly, that doesn't seem to be the case. Female inventors are not less responsive to rejections that occur after the first rejection. So all of this follow happens at the first rejection stage. So all of the action is really at this point. The next thing we're interested in is understanding the drivers of this gendered response to rejection. And I'll start by talking about the role of information in driving differential responses by male and female patent applicants. In order to do this, we leverage data on whether applications use a lawyer, which most do. Patent attorneys are quite specialized. They're required to pass a registration exam from the US Patent Office before they represent applicants more than 95% of applications use an attorney. And the patent attorney can be a really powerful tool for inventors. 
attorneys generally handle all of the communication with the examiner and solicit input or information from the inventor as needed. So an attorney can really be an expert who knows the process, has had to pass an exam about the process and about the details of patents, um, who can guide applicants through this. Next, we evaluate the role of resource constraints and gender differences in the interpretation of negative feedback by examining the effects for applications affiliated with firms. Applications are generally assigned to firms in our data when the inventor is an employee at the firm. So for example, if you work at Apple, it's in your employment contract that if you come up with an idea that gets patented while you work at Apple, the firm will own the rights to that patent. Firms also have internal processes to determine which ideas to pursue. So many large firms have, for example, a patent committee that hears proposals for patents and decides which to support. This also means that the inventor is less likely to be the decision maker who chooses whether or not to move forward with an application. Firms also pay for attorneys to represent applications, and there's a lot of internal support that inventors can get throughout this process. 63% of applications are affiliated with firms. So a significant number of applications come from firms. And this isn't always that the idea is an individual inventors and then the firm gains ownership. It could be something that the firm has created and then they apply for a patent on. So let's start by looking at the first row of results here that examines how using a lawyer affects patent outcomes. Applications from both men and women are more likely to proceed beyond an initial rejection if they use a lawyer. And this makes sense. Lawyers help advise applicants on how to respond to examiner comments, and they're generally very specialized, so they know the process. However, when we look at the effect for women differentially, there's no special effect for women. So that is male and female applicants do not benefit differentially from using a lawyer. What this suggests is that an information gap isn't the key driver of the effects that we see. If that were the case, we would think that using an attorney would help mitigate that gap for women. Then we turn to the effects by firm. Again, in the aggregate, when we look at applications that are affiliated with firms, we see that they're far more likely to be responsive to an initial rejection. And again, this also fits with our intuition because firms offer a variety of sources of support and it might not even be that the inventor is making this, the decision about whether or not to move forward and rather it's experts within the firm who are doing this. Then when we look at the effect for female applicants within firms, we find that women benefit more from being affiliated with the firm than male applicants. And this is really interesting because it indicates that there's something about this firm affiliation and firm support that helps bridge the gap between male and female inventors. It still doesn't completely eliminate the gap Female inventors are still on balance worse off than male inventors, even within firms. But this indicates that firms can provide some kind of, whether it's information or support, that's very valuable to help female inventors be more responsive. There are a few implications of these findings. The first is that access to resources appears to help close the gap in gender responses to rejection. So one thing to note here is that while we find that attorneys don't, uh, don't seem to move the needle for female applicants specifically, this could also be because of financial constraints. It might be that a female inventor hires an attorney but then is unable to continue paying that person. So at a firm that no longer becomes a constraint if the firm is paying for the lawyer. In addition, removing the applicant as the decision maker can increase the responsiveness of applications from female inventors. So again, within the firm context, it's not necessarily the applicant who's deciding whether or not to continue with the application process. In fact, sometimes I've spoken with inventors who talk about how they had an idea and then they didn't even find out what was happening in the process until the patent was granted because it was all handled by experts within the firms and the attorney. So removing the applicant from the process may help close this gap between male and female inventors. So overall, what we find are that female majority and all female teams are significantly less likely to continue in the patent process and be granted a patent if they receive an initial rejection. Interestingly, this gap in persistence widens as the presence of women on inventor teams increases. 
So that is to say, the intensive margin of female representation appears to matter here. The effect we saw for teams that were half or more female were smaller than uh, the effects for all female teams. Support from firms can decrease this gender gap, which suggests that it could be a resource constraint or confidence gap that drives these differing responses to rejection. There are some important implications from a firm perspective here. The first is that female innovators ideas are under leveraged even within organizations. This opens up a few opportunities for firms. The first is that uh, female inventors ideas could be a, a source of comparative advantage, both because of just increased innovation, the fact that female inventors ideas don't end up converting to patents at the same rate as male inventors ideas suggests that these firms could be leaving ideas and innovations on the table. The second implication is that, as we know, women are more likely to innovate for women or are more likely to focus on ideas that are targeted to other women. So this suggests that firms could see increased and improved female focused innovations by capitalizing on female employees ideas. The second is thinking again about uh, specifically individual level career implications. Female innovators are less likely to reap the benefits of their innovations and this can take several forms. If you think about uh, careers and promotion or across firm mobility, individuals who have ideas that didn't convert to patents are less likely to be able to signal that they have this kind of expertise or knowledge. In addition, inventors see direct financial benefits as a result of either higher wages after having a patent or the ability to commercialize or sell their patent rights. And female inventors are missing out on this opportunity. We also know that there are differences in both entrepreneurial starts and uh, success at raising funding, for example, among other entrepreneurial outcomes and gender differences in patenting outcomes can contribute to this. We know that holding a patent can be a very valuable signal for investors and also can signal expertise. So this gap that we find in patenting outcomes can also contribute to differences in entrepreneurial success. One of the features of this work that excites me the most and that I think is the most important is its direct policy implications. What we find really is that the patent evaluation process itself can be a lever for increasing female representation in patenting. So again, I talked about this at first that there are a lot of things that go into this low number of women participating in the patenting process. And in many ways, that problem can be intractable because there are many points at which it exists and at which we can think about tackling it. You can think about secondary school education. You can think about uh, creating less hostile environments or more inviting environments for women to enter STEM jobs. But here we identify that the patent process, which is something on, about which we have very good data and which is relatively low hanging fruit to address, can help improve outcomes for women in patenting. If after receiving an initial rejection, applications for women were continued at the same rate as applications for men, there would be almost 13% more majority female patents granted. And this is almost seven, this is over 7,000 additional granted patents in the data that we use. The other important thing to note here is that it's, it seems that the provision of resources to patent applicants can help increase diversity. And this is actually something that is also a priority for the US Patent Office. I've presented this work in the Chief Economist's Office. And one of the things that they've recently started doing is offering free legal services for inventors who aren't able to pay for an attorney. So this is something that even uh, firms can, can think about focusing efforts on. It's a priority often within organizations to also increase the number and the success of female inventors within the organization. So it suggests that providing resources is one sort of cheap way to try doing this. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I really look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you very much, Gary, for the great presentation.